Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. On today's show, I'm going to bring you some actual history from this book right here, Border Wars of Texas by James T. DeShields. This was originally published back in 1912. So today I'm going to begin uh, reading from this. This is actually a chronological account of all the battles between settlers and Indians uh, in Texas between around 1820 to 1845 or so. The history of that period in which the Spaniards occupied Texas, 1690 to the Mexican Revolution in 1820, and not inappropriately called the Mission Era, has much to do with the native and migrated tribes who had occupied the country from the earliest times. But no systematic account of the Indian troubles of this period has ever been attempted, and indeed the materials for such a narrative are yet to be searched out and translated from the documents and archives of that time. Enough, however, is known to warrant the assertion that the bold Apaches and Comanches in their perennial raids and depredations were the dread and scourge of the western frontier under both Spanish and Mexican rule. Being in fact the rightful owners of the country to which a native tribe gave name, by priority of occupation at least, these brave and warlike tribes held all intruders as vassals to their powerful confederacy. The following statement by historian Kennedy will serve to illustrate the conditions in that section during the time referred to. In the destruction of the missions, the Comanches were the principal agents. Encouraged by the passive submission of the Mexicans, who were of mixed blood, they carried their insolence so far as to ride into Bejar and alight in the public square, leaving their horses to be caught and pastured by the obsequious soldiers of the garrison, on pain of chastisement. To raise a contribution, they would enter the town with a drove of Mexican horses, stolen by themselves and under pretense of having rescued the Caballada from hostile Indians, would exact a reward for their honesty. They openly carried off herds of cattle and horses from the settlements east of the Rio Grande, sparing the lives of the herdsmen not from motives of humanity, but because they deemed it impolitic to kill those who were useful in raising horses and mules for the benefit of the Comanches. Thus we see the lordly Comanches were more than a match for the Spaniards and Mexicans, and after more than a century of untiring effort to conciliate and Christianize these Indians and to people the territory of Texas, Mexico was willing to give up in despair. The leading object of the Mexican government in allowing colonization of Texas, says Newell, was undoubtedly the protection of her frontiers from the hostile invasion of the Indians. The Comanches and other tribes had waged a constant and ruinous warfare against the Spanish settlements at Bejar and Goliad on the western limits of Texas, and extended their ravages also beyond the Rio Grande. Mexico, even under the government of Old Spain, had been unable to subdue or restrain them, and she would have had to abandon Texas altogether, if not other parts of her territory, had she not found a people willing to, for the sake of a small portion of her soil, go in and subdue them. These Indians the colonists had to subdue at their own expense, and on their own account. Mexico gave them nothing, the lands only were valuable because they made them so. They were determined to keep it free not only from Indian cruelty, but also from Mexican tyranny. But a new era dawned in the history of Texas. Henceforward, the Indians had to deal with a more formidable intruder, that invincible vanguard of Western civilization, the American pioneer. The first conflict between Anglo-Americans and Texas Indians occurred on Galveston Island late in the fall of 1819, antedating more than a year the arrival of Moses Austin at San Antonio de Bejar. Seeking permission to establish a colony in the province of Texas, at that time the patriotic but unfortunate General James Long, venturing a second expedition into Texas, was fortified with 50-odd of his followers at Bolivar Point, opposite the east end of Galveston Island. A French sloop, freighted with Mexican supplies, wines, etc., and bound for Casano, stranded near the present city of Galveston. The Caroncoa Indians, to the number of 200 warriors, were encamped in the immediate vicinity, and they at once attacked and butchered all on board that luckless craft, destroying the cargo and indulging in a drunken carousel and war dance. 
long determined to avenge this outrage, and after nightfall, with thirty men, he crossed over in small boats to the island, and while the orgies were at their height, made a vigorous attack upon the unsuspecting and jubilant Indians. Quickly rallying from their surprise and confusion, they secured their weapons and, yelling furiously, met their assailants with determined courage. Superior in numbers, they were a full match for the settlers. A desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight of doubtful issue now ensued, but Long effected a timely retreat to his boats, leaving 32 Indians killed and many wounded. Three of his own men were killed, and two, George Early and another, were badly wounded. In 1821, after Lafitte was forced to abandon his little kingdom by the United States naval authorities, a Dr. Parnell with a party of about 20 men visited the island to search for supposed buried treasures. Encountering about a hundred Karankawas at their favorite camp, the Three Trees, the Americans again attacked and defeated the Indians who left the island forever, it is said carrying off several dead and wounded and leaving one of their children as prisoner. The only casualty to the settlers was the slight wounding of Dr. Parnell, an arrow pinning the cap to the skin of his head, which he failed to notice till after the fight. It was these attacks, suggests historian Yoakum, that made the Karankawas so hostile to Austin's colonists in after years. A new era had dawned in the history of Texas. The fair land was not destined to remain unsettled. Civilization was rapidly advancing to the southwest. The American pioneer was coming as the courier and advance guard. Austin and his first colonists had boldly entered the wilderness and were determined to maintain a foothold though they did so under difficulties and suffering great privations. The first settlers arrived on the Brazos River during the last days of December 1821, and the dawn of New Year's Day 1822 marks the date of the first permanent Anglo-American settlement in Texas. Austin's colony soon attracted the attention of home seekers throughout the whole Southwest, and other settlers continued to arrive overland and by water. In June of 1822, the Schooner only son, with upward of 90 immigrants, among them Horatio Chrisman, who became the noted surveyor and Indian fighter of Austin's colony, and supplies for the new colony anchored in Matagorda Bay. A few days later, another vessel from New Orleans entered the mouth of the Colorado River. Among the passengers aboard that vessel from New Orleans was Samuel M. Williams, afterwards the famous secretary of Austin's colony. The passengers from both vessels were landed on the west bank of the Colorado River, at a point three miles above its mouth where they went into camp and erected temporary storage for their goods. Before leaving for the interior, a treaty of friendship was formed with the Indians, and four young men were left to guard their property. While six of their number, including Helm and Claire, were dispatched to La Bahia for means of transportation. On returning with Mexican carts, they found the camp had been attacked, the guards had been murdered, and supplies were all destroyed or carried away by the faithless and fiendish Indians. This was a most serious loss to the immigrants and caused them much suffering for lack of provisions and other necessities. The sad news reaching the settlement, a party of colonists were soon collected, armed, and in pursuit. Locating the camp of the enemy, the settlers made a surprise attack, recovering a remnant of their supplies and routing the Indians with some loss. Thus hostilities commenced, and with brief intervals they were carried on for years, resulting in the loss of many valuable lives and the final extermination of this once powerful and formidable coast tribe. With much stealth, the Indians often lay in ambush till the men would leave their cabins when, without warning, they would rush upon the unprotected and helpless women and children, who pleaded for mercy in vain. On one occasion, only one child out of a large family was found alive, but it was mortally wounded by an ugly arrow. The whites may not have been so wantonly cruel and bloodthirsty, but they were equally stubborn and determined. The conflict was inevitable, irresistible, one of expulsion and extermination. Scores of tragedies were enacted between the immigrants in Austin's colony and the aborigines during the first years of its feeble existence, the particulars of which, alas, were never recorded. Such reliable notes as we have been able to gather, mostly from the Kaikendal reminiscences, will be given in the order of their occurrence. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there for this episode. Again, this is from a recently acquired book I got. 
uh, Border Wars of Texas by James T. DeShields. Now, they mentioned some battles with the Karankawa Indians in this book. In a recent article uh, that I'll post in the information section for this video, it suggests that at that time the Karankawa Indians moved to the Rio Grande Valley, where they have some descendants living today. So if you want to hear more actual history like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.